Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. May blessings, praise, laudation, and eulogy uh, be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, uh, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual given by the Holy Spirit blessing in the heavenly realm. Now, we talked about God blessing us in finances, that's the earthly realm. Now we're talking about God blessing us in the spiritual realm. Can you hear that? And verse 4, even as in his love he chose us, actually picked us out for himself as uh, his own in Christ before the foundation of the world. How many of you see that? Now he chose us, and he chose us to be in union with him before the creation of the universe, before the foundation of the world. Now, how do you know that God chose you before he even started the work of the earth? Because it says here, he chose you before in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be wholly consecrated, set apart unto him, and blameless, blameless in his sight, even above reproach before him in love. He chose you, but he chose you in a predetermined condition. He saw you righteous before you had a chance to mess up. And he said he, he chose you blameless in his sight. And even above reproach, he saw you in that condition before the foundation of the earth. Now, in this process, verse 5, for he foreordained us and, dest and destined us. All this is before everything got put in position. And he planned in love for us. Everything that he destined us, he planned in love for us to be adopted. That's what happened. Revealed as his own children through Jesus Christ in accordance with the purpose of his will because it pleased him and was his kind intent. It was his intent, his kindness was what was motivating him to bless you before you were even created. Adam wasn't even existing but God in his mind saw his child like you see your child. When you hear you're going to have a son, you start seeing him playing basketball or playing football or, or any of those things. I'm just using it. And, and when you see that little girl that's coming and you think you might have a child, a girl, then you see that little girl in all of her beautiful uh, little girliness and you see that. Am I right? And so God, before he said, I'm going to build this thing called the earth, he had in his mind your perfect predestined condition. How I mean, you know, that's pretty amazing. But it fits what he did with us. How many of you, when you were about ready to give birth to that child, saw them as that terrible too? No. No. Now, if you could stick them back in there for that period of time, you would have rejoiced, right? If you could have put them back in and said, you know what, I'll come back and get you, but it don't work. So the beginning of how God sees us is really how he intends us to be because he sees the beginning from the end. So what he saw us as is where we're going to end up being because he saw it from the beginning and is bringing it back to conditions of today. Now, watch this. Verse 6. So that we might be to the praise and the commendation of his glorious grace, favor, and mercy, which he so freely bestowed on us, the beloved. How many of you know he's redeemed us? There's redemption. He delivered us. This is all preconditioning. How do you hear that? I'm going to tell you what God did. He profiled you. He profiled you before you were born. That's heavy duty. The abundance, abundance of biblical evidence from both the Old and the New Testament 
has firmly established that we were chosen for greatness in him, by him, for him, uh, before we were born. How many say, Lord, thank you, I was chosen for greatness before I was born. Romans chapter 8, turn there, Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Ah, whom he foreknew. He knew you before he knew you on the earth. Wow. Wow. And he predestined, he predetermined, he preset your destiny. Come on. And he said it so that you would be conformed. That means fit into the pattern of his dear son. How do you hear that? In the image of his son that we might be the first, he might be the firstborn among many of us. Moreover, whom he did predestine them, he also called. So, so, so God preset your destiny and put a call on your life. So every one of us has a call while we're in the womb, no. While we're in the cell, no. Before we were even. We were only in the mind of God a thought. God thinks pretty powerful. And so God thought, and all of us were in there. Because it says that, that Levi was in the loins of Abraham before Levi was born. Well, I'm talking about us being in the loins of God's mind before God ever made the earth and put man on it. Wow. Isn't that heavy? So God made a place to put the thought that he had. And every time God has a thought, when he speaks the thought, the thought becomes what he speaks. Let there be light. He had light in his head, and light came out of his mouth, and light created planet, stars, and the rest. Our corporate destiny, don't miss this. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to finish this. Moreover, he predestined, then he called, and whom he called, then he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. So here's the key. He not only justified us just as if I hadn't sinned. That's the way he saw us. That's what justification is, just as if I hadn't. And then he decided not only to call us, he decided to share his glory. He decided to put his glory on us. So we came out of the womb with a destiny, a call, and a pre-glorious outpouring. But sin met us at the gateway of the womb and corrupted the plan. And Lucifer began to interact with the soul of the new creation man and began to bring him away from the intended plan. Have you hear that? And Suke, the soul, interacted with Lucifer and from the beginning, sin took hold of our lives. Have you hear that? Now, we were shaped in the womb of sin, but we had a predestined destiny from God, even though we had to come through the gateway of a sin avenue or a sin door. But God didn't want us to end up in that sinful condition. So Jesus came, Jesus died, we come out, we're on the earth, we get the privilege uh, of having him reveal himself to us. And then we have the choice to say yes to his will. Can you hear me now? Our corporate destiny is to be conformed into the image and likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ, fully expressing expressing his nature and his glory. The Father's ultimate intention is that he may inhabit, subdue, and ex exercise dominion in the earth 
through the corporate son, come on, the body of Christ. Was God's plan to not make a new Savior, but to make many brethren from the Savior? There will never be another Jesus. There is only one Savior. There is only two Adam. One Adam, two Adam. Second Adam is sinless. First Adam, sin and fell. You and I are the brethren of the second Adam. And we have all rights, all privileges, all operational functions as an heir to the salvation that our brother got, our elder brother, Jesus, passed through us. We have that today available. What's the problem with this? That's the question. What's the problem? When the first Adam fell, he might, I've said this before. When the first Adam fell, I think he fell on his head. I don't think he fell on his back or his knees. I think he fell on his head. Because we were in him, and so we've suffered brain problems ever since. Think about it. We've been brain dead. And the thing that's sad is, is that Adam operated with 100% of his brain. We're down to seven. Give us another 100 years, we'll be hitting on around four. And, and get down to another 100 years, we'll be in the one and twos. That's why we're inventing computers. So that we won't have to think anymore because we're predetermining and planning our own ability to not be able to function but to rely on an artificial means to help us think when we can't think. Because we're conditioning ourselves and we know the condition of ourselves and we know that if it won't for the computer, we wouldn't remember, we wouldn't know what to do. Hello? Now, we lost our right mind which is all that he had in mind for us when God created us he created us to have the life and pattern of Christ isn't that right why then don't we have the mind of Christ if I have the spirit of Christ I have the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, if I can have the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, why don't I have the same mind, which the Bible does tell me, I can have the mind of Christ? Hello? How many of us today would really be ticked off if we realized that Satan has successfully worked it out so that we are having mental conditions. That we are mentally midgets, but in the spirit world, we're giant slayers. I can drive out demons. I can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I can prophesy and tell people of their future. And I mean, I can move in the gifts of God. Where's my keys? Oh, come on, saints. I came here to help you today. Tell somebody, say, the pastor's going to open the door and we're going to run in as soon as it opens. I'm going to open the door. I can't hold it long. When I put my foot at it and I prop it open, you better run your off and get in there. Are you hearing me? Okay. Now, <laughs> we lost our right mind, which that we had was the mind of God, the mind that he had for us, along with, have you know, when, when we fell on our head from Adam's decline, how many of you know we, we lost our name? We lost who we were. We even lost our language. So what happens in redemption is I begin to have my mind renewed and restored 
and not formed to the fashions of the world, I begin to think like Christ thought and thought it not robbery to be like God. So I begin to think God thoughts. And when I begin to think God thought thoughts, I begin to understand my name is Christ-like. I'm a Christian. I am, that's why it's Jesus Christ. I am Christ-like. And in my new name, I got a language that is the same language that they speak in heaven. And I can speak the heavenly language on the earth and communicate mysteries uh, that my mind don't understand uh, but the new man in me says oh I know a language uh, that'll communicate me all the way towards heaven I believe Adam in the garden spoke in tongues He knew what the Father was thinking before the Father thought because the heaven language is a communication that makes you be able to understand what God's thinking and doing in heaven. So when you pray and you pray in your own, you pray amiss. But when you pray in the heavenly language, you're able to discern the mysteries of the secrets of God. So we got a name, we got a language, wow. We got a destiny, but saints, we have a brain that they say is even in the 7 to 10% that, they, that the doctors analogi- anal- analyzing it say, that's the one with the 10%, saying we have in the 10% that they understand the most complex computer ever, ever seen, heard of, or built in our head called the brain, and they still don't understand it all. It's a discovery going on all the time, and yet the ones that are discovering it are only discovering it with 10% of their own brain. What if the ones discovering it moved to the 50? Man, they would help us all move up a little bit. What if? By the grace of God, I begin to realize that the war that goes on goes on in my mind. And the mind field that comes across me all the time is the mind of Lucifer trying to intercept and bring interference in my mind's ability to perceive, to understand, to have wisdom, and to operate at the capacity that the first Adam operated. And so that I can see things, understand things, know the mysteries of God, know the Word of God, and be expanded to be able to say, Hold on a minute. I've been ignorant, but I no longer choose to be. How many of you want the mind of Christ? Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4 in the Amplified. For the God of this world has blinded the unbelievers' minds. Oh, how do you believe that murdering liar, thief, has come to destroy the seed that is in the mind that is able to create and able to work itself. How many of you know the brain is what is developing the the intellect and the uh, creations that are healing cancers, heart diseases, eye sicknesses? Come on. It is the little 10% of the brain that God, he's not using uh, the spirit alone. He is using the uh, spirit to activate the mind of Christ uh, so that we can be new creatures in Christ Jesus. Wow. How would you like to know everything? How would you like to look out at the, at the, the, the galaxies and be able to say, oh yeah, well the they, they, they space, you know, the, the, the ones that the satellites that have the, you know, satellite mission, um, um, what do you call it, um, the lens that can see, you know, all the way into the next universes and all. Oh, I know what's back there. I already, I, I know what's over there and I know what's over there. 
How many of you know there's parts of the ocean that we don't even know what's on there? We don't know the creatures that are down there, six miles, seven miles deep. We've never been down there. How many of you know that what God wants to do is to restore our mind? Satan's purpose was to seal everyone's foreordained identity. He's an identity thief, just like we see in computers. If we don't know who we are in Christ, we will never know what we have in Christ. Philippians 2.5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Wow. How do you say, Lord, I need the same mind? Look at this. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Why? Because if you have the mind of God, the mind determines your facial expressions. It determines your actions. It determines things. How many of you hear that? That's why I'm always saying about people who walk around and they want people to see that they're mad. Or they want people to see something on their face that will help them get across that they are. How do you know, I read where a guy went in the presence of a living God. And when he came down, his face shone as though he had been in the glory of God. How do you know your face is supposed to show that you've been near God? 1 Corinthians 2.16 in the Living Bible says we Christians actually do have within us the very thoughts in the mind of Christ. And here's what's frustrating, and here's a, here's a piece to this door. I'm going to wedge the door open a little further. You ready to run in? What would you do if at the end of your life you found out you had the mind of Christ that whole time? Wouldn't you be ticked off? It'd be like finding out you had... A hundred million dollars sitting in the bank and some fool forgot to tell you about it. Wouldn't that be frustrating? You're there, you're deathbed, you're going, you're leaving, there ain't nothing. And somebody runs in, oh, excuse me, last minute. Oh, I'm so glad I got here. I hope I'm not too late. You have a hundred million dollars. Here's the check. Brrrr. Oh, my God. That would be a bummer. Look at Romans chapter 12. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. But verse 2 says, and be not conformed to this world. Now here's where you're going to get your brain to come alive. The conformity to this world is eating the cells in your brain. The conformity of Satan is... He wants you to conform to the culture so the culture is designed to kill your brain cells because it'd be dangerous if you thought outside of the culture because then the culture would be in trouble. So Satan is constantly aware that you must be conformed to the culture, to the world system, so you think robotically like the world wants you to think. How many of you know great men, Einstein and those type of people, how many of you know they stepped out of the normal flow of the culture? Daniel and his three buddies there, they stepped out of the mindset of the Babylonian confusion and stepped into revelational understanding of hearing God. Can you hear that? Paul came against the Pharisees, came against the Sadducees, came against the religious order of Rome and these things because, and even at Mars Hill, they were worshiping a God they did not know. And Paul stepped out of that and stepped into the realm where his brain began to be impacted. That's how come he could write these books that we read today. And we're so amazed at how he could write them in prison because Paul had tapped in to an infusion that his mind uh, was plugged in. Uh, he, he plugged his, his uh, uh, port into the Holy Ghost, but he plugged it into the mind of God, and he began to get a download uh, so he could write the words of God. 
And it says, be not transformed, I mean, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transforms, when you transform something, you move it, transportation, you move it to something. So we have to move from something to something uh, by renewing our mind. How do you renew? You already have the mind of Christ. It just has to be (laughs) jump-started. It just has to be renewed. Well, see, if I think on these things, I begin to put into my input the new systems download. This is a OS 1111, Genesis, Genesis, Genesis. I begin to put download into my brain, and my brain says, oh, I like that. I feed off that. That's what I'm looking for. And the brain starts to multiply because I'm putting the Word of God in my head, and I'm thinking on those things, and because of it, I begin to think like God thought because He wrote it. Wow. And some of you that don't read the Bible, and some of you don't read the Word every single day, You're suffering from brain disease. Culture has ruined your thinking process. You're not thinking on the things above. You're thinking on the things below. Hello. Renewing there, it says in your, uh, transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The word renewing is complete renovation. (laughs) A change for better as the word kainos, kainos, which is new in freshness. How many of you know you have the mind of Christ, you just have to have a refreshing? Can you hear that? How many of you know once in a while with these computers, you got to download them and refresh them? In the mind just like that. Now, look here. We, God's people, God's church, are entering a period, a time of a shift, a major shift. God has begun to visit his people as he promised in the book of Acts 2.17. In these last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Hello. And it's the, it says in Acts 2.17, what he's going to do is pour out his spirit on all flesh. And it's going to be like the latter rain. How many of you know God is going to cause the latter rain to come on the church that was greater than the former rain? So the former rain of all the past revivals is good, but the latter rain is going to eclipse what the first rain didn't do. How do you say, Lord, you mean we're getting ready to enter into a new period where you start to pour out over your people a fresh illumination of the mind of God? We begin to think like God. We begin to operate like God. We begin to move like God. We become God-like more than we've ever been before. Wow. Wow. He is promising that as it pertains to all of his children, look what he said in Job 8, 7. Though your beginnings were small, yet your latter end will, would increase abundantly. Say with me, my latter is going to be better than my former. Have you say, Lord, thank you for the beginning, but I thank you for where I'm going. Because if you live only from where you started, you'll never get to where you're supposed to go. How do you know the Holy Ghost wants to empower you so that you can think the right thoughts? Yes. Jeremiah 16, verse 19, verse 19, and uh, verse through 21. O oh Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge. In the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth. Look at this, saints. In the day of affliction, Hollywood's going to come to the church. In the day of the affliction, the politicians are going to turn to the church. In the day of the NFL and then all the other sports, when their day is coming to the day of affliction, they're going to turn to the church. Let's go up to Zion. Because they're going to call up and say, I don't have an answer. I, I don't have any people coming to my game anymore. I, I've been let go. I don't have a career. I don't have a purpose. I had a concert and no one came. I did a movie and nobody came to watch. It's happening all the time. Hollywood is producing movies that nobody even went to see. Why do you think they invented Netflix? Hmm. Wow. And he says here, 
Surely our fathers. Uh, it says, uh, you're my refuge, you're my strength, and my fortress, my refuge. In the day of affliction, the Gentiles will come to you from the ends of the earth and say, surely our forefathers or our fathers have inherited lies, worthlessness, and unprofitability. Is that, ev is that tremendous? And he said, unprofitable things. Will a man make gods for himself which are not gods? Therefore, behold, I will this once cause them to know. I will cause them to know my hand and my might. And they shall know that my name is the Lord. He said, I'm going to let them know my hand and my might. Signs, wonders, and miracles are going to break out in a national level. And they're going to break out universal around the world. Because God says right here in Jeremiah, when they come to the place uh, where they inherited lies of their fathers and worthlessness and unprofitable things, now they're going to turn to the church and they're going to say, how do I know this? And God said, I'm going to show them my hand and I'm going to show them my might. I'm going to show them miracles. I'm going to show them wonders and I'm going to show them that I'm God. Have you say, Lord, uh, could you do that through me? God is coming upon his people to change our thinking and to cause them to know. Look at this. Throughout generations, God has come to his people in order to do as the prophet Elijah asked in 2 Kings 6 2. Here's the total of my message today. Lord, he said to the servants, they, they, the enemy had come around, Syrians were coming around, they had them trapped. And, and Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. I'm going to pray today that God will open your eyes so that you begin to see. And if you want to see, you'll know how good the Lord is. Now, this is what God is doing. He is causing us to know him, his ways, his purpose, and his power. He is opening our eyes. The story of 2 Kings was during a battle. Elijah's servant's eyes were opened to see there was a greater with us than was against us. He is opening our eyes to see the weapons of our warfare. Can you hear that? Seeing the changes. Uh, when you see, it changes your countenance. Look at 2 Corinthians 3 and 7. Now, if the dispensation of the death engraved in the letters on the stone, the ministration of the law was inaugurated with such glory and splendor that the Israelites were not able to look steadily at the face of Moses because of his brilliance, a glory that was to fade and pass away. The glory that was on Moses' face was going to pass away because another glory greater that was going to be in us was coming. Why should uh, not uh, the dispensation of the Spirit, the spiritual ministry, whose task it is to cause men to obtain and be governed by the Holy Spirit, be attended with much greater and more splendid glory? For if the service that condemns the ministration of doom had glory, how infinitely more abounding in splendor and glory must be the service that makes righteous the ministry that produces and fosters righteous living and right standing with God. Verse 13, nor do we act like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze upon the finish of the varnishing splendor which is upon him, O God. The church has put a veil over our face. Instead, God wants us to take the veil off. And once that happens, people will see and see the glory of the countenance of God that's on you. And will begin to see because you see. Verse 15, yes, down to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies upon the minds and the hearts of the people, the Israelites. Verse 16, but whenever a person turns in repentance to the Lord, the veil is stripped off and taken away. God strip the veil off of your people today. Take the veil that's kept us uh, from being able to see. How many of you know a veil not only keeps people from seeing you, but keeps you from seeing out? But when the veil is opened up, you have no place to hide. You can't be a 007 Christian. You have to begin to see and see things the way God sees them, and you begin to operate under the anointing because now they see you and you see them. You there? Amen. Have you know God changes our faces by opening our eyes? Can you hear that? 
Look what it says in Genesis 1. Darkness was upon the face of the earth. Darkness that was, that was uh, uh, the, the darkness was removed because it was on the face of the earth. How many know when darkness is removed from our face, we're going to shine like the glory of God? But as long as the culture has kept our hearts uh, and, and kept us in secrecy and kept us in sin, then we can't see and no one can see who we are. I want to introduce to this city and to this region the church, and it's you. And we're going to take the veil off here today. And he's opening our eyes. Oh, God. Can you hear that? He's opening our eyes. Oh, God, help me. Can you hear that? I love what it says in Psalm 34. This is the last thing. Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord our God is good. Blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied is the man who trusts and takes refuge in him. How many of you know you and I are driven by these senses, taste and see. In the natural, we live by that. Once you taste and see how good the Lord is, it turns your heart towards repentance, which causes the veil to fall off. And you no longer are a prisoner of the culture because now the thing has been busted open. It's revealed. The veil is off. You can see and they can see you. And the glory that's been hidden is now revealed. Wow. Can you hear that? If you looked at, at, at more of this, they looked to him and were radiant. Their faces, uh, it talks about, their faces, it, it says, uh, were were, were, shall never blush in shame. Their faces will never again look like that. They will never again blush and be ashamed because the glory of God was there. It is God's goodness that leads us to repentance, Matthew, uh, Romans 2, 4. His kindness leads us to repent, change our minds and our soul to accept God's will. Psalm 23, verse 6 says, Goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. And Mark 8, 18, there are those who have eyes, but they do not see. My prayer today is that God would open your eyes, that you could begin to see and that others could begin to see you. Stand to your feet today and say, Lord, thank you for revelation that will open my eyes. Uh, open my eyes, not only the eyes of your Mind, the eyes of your understanding, the eyes of the Spirit. God, open my eyes. Put your hands into heaven for a minute and say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for this day. I thank you for what you're about to do. I thank you that, God, you are taking uh, the lid off. You are undoing something. You want to take off uh, the inhibitor, the thing that has caused the people of God uh, to be blind, uh, who have been able to not see, and they have walked about on the earth with a veil over their face, uh, and they've hidden behind the veil because if they hide behind the veil, it is like the covering uh, uh, of, of hidden things that Satan comes to do, to blind the mind of the saints of God, uh, the potential of a believer. God, we thank you today. The veil's going to be ripped uh, and it's going to be tore open uh, and I'm no longer going to be hidden behind uh, the veil of unbelief and the veil of the culture of the world. Father, I thank you for the anointing right now that will come over this room and begin to open the eyes of your people, that they would begin to see, God, uh, the mysteries of the kingdom. They would see the depths uh, and the broadness uh, of your plans and purposes, oh God, uh, that you didn't save them just to get them out of hell. You saved them uh, to empower them uh, and to give them instruction uh, and to give them purpose uh, and to give them initiative, uh, to give them a conqueror spirit.